when were you born? I was born in Granite City. Uh, the date was November 20th, 1951, which was a long time ago. Who are or were your parents and what were their occupations? Well, my um, original dad was Benjamin Chalovic, and he passed away one year after I was after our, I was born. Uh, my mom remarried. She had three daughters and a son, and she married a gentleman that was uh, re uh, that had been in the Air Force, and he had just gotten out. Who are or your, who are your siblings? Names and gender. Well, Brian is my oldest. Uh, then we have Nathan. Brian's 42. Nathan is 40. And then Daniel's my youngest, and he is 36. Did any of them serve in the military? No. Uh, I wanted uh, my oldest to, in fact, whenever I talked to my oldest son when he graduated from high school, I told him it's either go away to college or join the service. So he decided to go away to college instead of the service. What were you doing before you entered the service? Um, I was going to college. Um, I attended about one out of ten classes, so I was pretty much not responsible for myself, uh, mainly because my parents were paying for it and I didn't have anything, no responsibility at all other than just to be there. What happened was my grades had dropped and they had a draft and so I was no el lo I was eligible for the draft and that's how I ended up in the military. What were you going to college for? Actually I wanted to be a soccer coach but I was kind of, what would you say, disappointed because I had to take all these courses that didn't have anything to do with soccer coach like algebra, paintings, art, and um, so just got discouraged. In which branch of military did you serve? The United States Air Force. Why did you want to serve in the Air Force? It wasn't a question of why I wanted to serve in the Air Force. It's more of a question I didn't want to be in the Army or the Marines, mainly because most of those guys was going over to Vietnam at the time. I had no idea what Vietnam was. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know what anything. So I was just looking not to have to go over there. And fortunately, I was the Air Force accepted me. What happened when you were departed for training camp and during your early days of training? Um, it was a unique experience. We arrived. Uh, and San Antonio, Texas, late at night, about 10.30 at night. Two other buses pulled up. One bus was full of young men from New York City that had um, the afros and all that stuff. And I was from the Midwest, and I go, oh my goodness, I'm in trouble here. So, um, but after a couple weeks, we all bonded together, as the military does, whether no matter what branch it is, and we become brothers um, instead of strangers in a quick time. Do you recall any of your instructors? If so, what were they like? Um, I recall two instructors, or actually three. One, my first instructor was Tech Sergeant Reed, and um, they're all they're all mean and tough. And back then, they were able to strike you uh, in basic training, which didn't happen to me. And um, after three weeks in basic training, they said I had left a door open in the dormitory. So they said I had to go back two weeks and redo more training. And uh, my sergeant back then was Sergeant Balonis, who I had a good nickname for him, who takes after a lunch meet. And um, he told me that before I came that I would be the latrine queen for both of the latrines. And uh, so that was a special honor, and um, it just went on from there. How did you adapt to military life, including the physical regiment, barracks, food, and social life? Um, I thought it was fairly easy for me to adapt because I had played sports, soccer, wrestling, and all that stuff. So 
um, the physical part wasn't that bad. Uh, adapting to not having your own mind other than to follow orders was tough. Um, and and they if um, if they if you got on the wrong side, then you were pretty much in in, in deep trouble. So um, you get through that and and you just make do. But I'm grateful that I did go because I had no order or discipline when I was in college. Was the food good? It didn't make any difference whether the food was any good or not. You were hungry, so you ate. But most to say. Uh, I guess it was all right. Where did you serve? Well, I was stationed in basic training in Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Um, back in those days, the dorms were not air conditioned, so and it was late June, late June, July, so it was very hot, miserable. Um, then I. Um, was assigned to Biloxi, Mississippi, which was Keesler Air Force Base. And I was there for nine months in training, and then I was stationed in Chick Sands, England for three years. Was that an experience being in England? Um, yeah, I thought being stationed in England would be a little bit easier because you can understand what the people are saying. They speak English, but their English is different than our English and it was a little bit harder to pick up what they were trying to say. Pretty much wherever you went in the military, any, any of those bases, the local population didn't care for you too much, um, especially when you're young men and there's young women around the base. And so there was a, a lot of um, conflict, I would say, a lot of friction. How would you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Um, it was basically writing letters, which I was not good at. Um, I had uh, just married before I left because I was afraid that if I was going to be over there for three years that she would not wait for me when I came back. And I think that was on a lot of people's minds when they went into the military. So I had decided, I had proposed to her uh, three months before, or three weeks before I was supposed to go over to England. And so she ended up joining me over there. What did you do when you were off duty? Off duty. Well, I didn't want to live on base because you're stuck with those guys for eight hours every day. So we moved about 20 miles, bought a car, uh, about 20 miles from base, and we lived in a little town called Gamlin Gate. There was probably eh, 800 people in there. And they had never met an American before. So my wife and I had a good time with that because we're social and um, and the English like to have a party every week. I can remember one story is that uh, the first Sunday we was in our house, um, I, it was raining, so I had a little barbecue pit, so I was barbecuing. Well, the next door neighbor climbed over the fence with his hose and was going to put the fire out because they had never heard of barbecue before. And I go, no, John, no, we're cooking. We're, you know, so we invited him over for dinner, and uh, I, I forgot what we had, but... Uh, and his wife was French, and he's Irish, so there's a mix there. The next, he says, well, I want to do this. I want to have a block party, and I want to barbecue. So I, great. Well, I worked a day turn, and or I came home at 3, and there's this big pillar of black smoke coming out of his backyard. I go, what the heck? So I got my hose, and I ran over to his house, and he had he borrowed my barbecue pit but he put coal in it not charcoal so there was charcoal dust all over the sausages and everything so lack of communication on that one how did you return home i returned i flew home um, i was one of the uh, ones in the service where I did not have an early discharge, so I had to spend the exact amount of days of four years and in the military. How did you readjust to civilian life? It was, it was hard. Um, I sent my wife home first. We, uh, our son was born over in, in England, so he has dual citizenship. When we got home, she had found a little house here on East 23rd Street, but unfortunately, 
um, I still had my, I could go back to my job at the steel mill. At midnight, uh, they had a crane that loaded all the scrap into the railroad cars and it made a lot of noise and our house was right across the street from that. So there wasn't much sleep um, seven days a week, you know, just loud, loud, loud. So, but we adapted and uh, I think human beings can adapt to anything that they put their mind to. And so we, we didn't have a choice. We, we just had to make and go forward. Have you remained in contact or reunited with fellow veterans? If so, who? One of the toughest things I think in the military is when you get reassigned to a different base because you make friends and, um, and you pretty much don't. I mean, it was hard back then to stay in contact. I mean, um, it was letters. And service people aren't very good at writing letters. So eventually what I did is I reached out when they came out with Facebook. And I am still good friends with one, um, one other uh, brother in Utah, um, in American Fork, Utah. So we, we kind of like communicate back and forth. But the rest of them, I have no idea what happened. Are you a member of any veterans organization? I am a member of the American Legion. Um, I joined them because they knocked on my door and asked me if I wanted to join. And I figured if somebody's going to knock on my door and ask me, then at least I can do is give it a shot. And so me and another individual is helping the American Legion here in Granite. I think the average age is like 85. Uh, so they're a bunch of old guys and I'm one of the younger ones. So we're trying to help them with their fundraisers and spread the word around what American Legion does. What have you done since separating from the military? I've always been, well, I'll put it this way. My first job was my uncle had a farm, and I went and picked corn, and I put it in a barrel, and I pushed it around the block selling corn to all the neighbors for 50 cents a dozen. So I always was kind of like a business person. Um, so when I got out of the military, I worked at the steel mill for 25 years. I've coached a lot of soccer teams, done a lot of fundraisers charity work such as that. Um, but I wanted to have my own business, always did, so I ended up being a financial advisor for the last 23 years. How did your wartime experiences affect your life? I can honestly say, uh, and I'm going to get just a little bit spiritual here, is that if I hadn't been drafted, I probably would, I would have had a completely different life. I would have been non-responsible, probably not woke up for years. So when I got drafted, I think it was really one of those times that God <coughs> said, you're changing your journey here, and uh, you're going to go in the military. And that really did was one of the major changes in my life. What are some life lessons you've learned from military service? I think the number one is discipline and not to complain or make excuses. That's the three things that I, I guide my wife with. It doesn't do any good to make excuses. Nobody cares about why you didn't do something. They do care about why you do something. Number two is to have discipline in that when you say you're going to do something or you give somebody their word or whatever, they're just like your brother in, in the military. You're going to try to stay true to that. If you say you're going to help them, you help them. And then number three is just the obedience that you train yourself and that you want to you want to help other veterans number one you want to help number two is you want to help the kids that are growing up that don't know about the military and what veterans do and that's one of the reasons that I'm here is that they can understand that it's a, it's you don't learn this at home you, you know you in the military and basic training you don't get to ask why do you want me to do this you just have to do it How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? When I was, even though that I was not in combat, the career field that I was in, the three years that I was in England, we had nine suicides in, in the career field that I was in. So I do know about death. I do know what happens. I know the, know the value of life. My thought process is that we're ever going to send our young men and women into fight we have to know exactly what the goal is. 
when we get into a war, we can't just say we're going to go over there and kick some butt. We have to know exactly what we need to do and what we want to accomplish. And I don't think our country's done a very good job at that for the last Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan. I still don't know what the goal is. World War II, we know what the goal was. Get rid of Hitler. Would you like to leave a message for future generations who will view or hear this interview? Sure. Um, what I notice, because I still do a lot of coaching, is that uh, it's hard for my generation to understand, like the millennials, and I think now they have a millennial Z's or coming out, which would be the grade school kids. The difficulty is, is that when I look at the different generations, my mom and dad's generation, the greater, greater generation, I was a baby boomer, I had long hair, I wore the peace sign, and my mom and dad, I can just imagine what was going through their head, these kids are never going to amount to anything. And then whenever I had kids and they were doing their thing with uh, hip hop and I go, boy, I don't know if my kids have a chance. But one thing I've learned in my life is that each generation has to find their own way. The older generation can give advice or whatever, but the millennials have to find their own way. And I believe they're doing that. It's just that we have to be more patient now, still firm and still disciplined, but we have to be a little bit more patient and understanding of how all these young folks think. And I think if that happens, we'll have a pretty good country. Do you have any other funny stories or anything that you think we should discuss before we get the interview? Um, well, I have all kinds of stories. Some of them are true and some of them are not. And it seems that uh, when we get out of the military, it seems like our stories get more, um, more non-truth than truth. Um, I can tell you, um, in the military, my career field is it was not exciting. I wanted to learn something in the military. So I was a Morse code operator. And I don't know if any of you guys know what Morse code is, you learn it in the Boy Scouts. So what we did is um, it's just a bunch of little, you put a set of earphones on and you hear these dits and dots and dashes. And if you become good at it, you figure out what they're words. So what I did, what I noticed is that it's a tough job. One of the funniest stories that I know of is that we work shift work, so we work like from midnight till 8 o'clock in the morning for seven days in a row. And we had one, one sergeant there, and he had his earphones on, and he would just be typing and typing and typing on his typewriter for the whole eight hours. And we go, holy cow, his fingers are going to be like, he's not going to have any fingers, he's going to have like nubs. You know, he's doing so much typing, and the typewriter's going to catch fire, we was making jokes about it. Well, finally, one of us went to the frequency on the radio to what he was listening to, and there was nothing coming across of it. So he was just making letters up for eight hours. And um, he ended up, after two years, they um, decided that he had a mental illness and um, took him away, which was sad. But it was just funny that he would do that for all that time. I can't tell you, over in England, I got to... Um, uh, I got to visit up in Scotland, never got to go to Ireland. I had, a, I had what they call a U8 security clearance. And that enabled me to go to a position where I copied spies in France, Germany, and in um, Italy, uh, Russian spies, uh, and from other countries. Um, I was able to copy them and uh, send in what they were sending. What you know, we never knew exact. We never knew the words because everything's encrypted or in code. So when you're copying Morse code, it was just be five random letters in five in blocks, and you just keep copying them, keep copying them. So that was pretty cool. Until one time, I uh, caught on to a spy started to copy him, and it was, Mar it was Christmas. He typed in Merry Christmas, Joe. So they knew I was copying him. <laughs> so I thought I was really doing some 
heavy duty top secret work and they knew I would exactly what I was listening to so they never told you whether it was important or not it didn't make any difference at that time the reason so many we had so many suicides is because uh, when you inject um, if you've ever listened like to the a radio and it's in between stations and you hear a lot of static when you listen to that for seven or eight hours in a row day after day after day and um, they uh, they'd get depressed or whatever some of them took drugs and um, they jump out of the window or OD or you know whatever the case may be uh, which was sad I, I, I lost some very good friends over there um, with that they just couldn't deal with it so when you go into the military uh, you know it's it's unfortunate that not everybody can handle the discipline or the routine and um, are they just homesick or whatever the case may be there's a lot of emotions going to, into military even with the guys that's been in combat or whatever you know um, they suffer through that they don't want to talk a lot of them don't want to talk about that a lot of them want to do the I just you know I'll just tough it out type of um, thought process and um, it's it's hard it's hard so I never in fact, when like when they'd play on Fourth of July, whenever they'd play the national anthem or they play the, the and they tell the veterans to stand up, I never stood up um, during that time because I never fit, felt I was worthy, being that I was not in combat, that I was not worthy to sit stand with the guys and girls that were in combat and that had actually done fighting. My um, wife-in-law who is my daughter-in-law's mom. I had to come up with a name for her, so I call her my wife-in-law. Um, and um, she tapped me on the back. She said, get your butt up. She goes, you served just as, you know, you served your country just as much as anybody else did. So it was a false way of thinking for a veteran that if they haven't done the service, we all pitched in. It doesn't make any difference whether you mop floors or you, or you were a cook or whatever. It, it was a team. It's no different than a sports team. The, your, your team is only as strong as the weakest person in that team. And you learn that. Um, and when I think, when I really thought about it, I had sacrificed a lot. I spent four years in the military. I could have had a home. I could have had my job at the steel mill. I could have been making forty or $50,000 a year. I'm four years behind the people that didn't go. Um, so I look at it a lot differently now and I try to encourage all vets to stand up because they should be proud of the time that they spent for their country. Okay, I'd like to add just a little bit more if I could. Um, my thoughts are is I have no idea. I, I'm running into high school kids that want to join the military and they um, they don't know, you know, it was different whenever I went in. And I went in back in 1971. That was 45 years ago. I can't believe that. So it's, it, the military has changed. And, and I don't know how it's changed. I go, I still think of the military as whenever I was in it. You know, I still think of uh, young kids that were 10 or 11. I think they think the same way I thought when I was 10 or 11. And so we have to adapt to that. Our country has to adapt to that and understand. But one thing I know about the kids nowadays um, that are going to the military, they, wanna, they have this unique desire to listen to older, to veterans and, and older people. They just sit there and, and just soak it all in. I know they want to do things quick. You know, they want to text and they want to communicate. Um, but in, I know when you're in the military, when you're in a squad or a platoon or whatever, they don't text each other. Okay, they talk to each other. They communicate with one another. And if you don't have those skills, you're going to have a. It's going to be a tough time if you if you don't talk. And you and when you see people, you see their facial expressions. When you see your brother's facial expressions, you know the the pain they're in from being depressed or whatever. Then you can do something about it. If they were just texting each other, you wouldn't know. You don't know what's going on. So just like in a, in a school class or on a sports team or if you're working at McDonald's, 
you can't think of yourself as an individual. Think of yourself as a team. Everybody in that class is on your team. And if one person is struggling, you got to reach out and help. That's, that's life. Or we could be all individuals and go our each way and not accomplish anything. Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players, could not be that successful without the other four players on that team. He wouldn't score a basket. He had to count on his t other team to be great also. So that's, that's what I work for um, in, my, in my off time. Did you ever fly any planes? No, the first, well, the first plane I flew in was the transport coming up, going over to England. It was full of babies and young kids and it was uh, it was a propeller plane, so it took a long time to get where you wanted to go. So there was no sleep on that plane for sure. Got uh, got uh, landed in England, and um, the next plane was a cargo plane. Uh, in the cargo plane, there was just one pilot that they were taking it to um, a base close to where I was going to be stationed. The pilot was uh, halfway full of cans of soda and cans of beer. So they were making a flight just for that one pilot. What was kind of funny is that all the crew members, I was the only one on there, all the crew members were making the sign of the cross before they took off because they kind of like knew I hadn't flown before. And I'm going, oh my goodness. So I started praying. I started praying that the plane wouldn't fall apart or anything. So, But we made it and um, they, they had a good chuckle at that. That's fine. I'm a good humored guy. I pretty much got it. Um, while I was stationed in England, um, I can say that I uh, made some awful, wonderful friends, just awful, uh, t just great people, and the relationship you build. So then I start thinking, well, I'm kind of like an ambassador for our country because these people have never met an American. Um, so most of the time, I, I learned three things. Don't talk about the Queen. Um, the, the, they love the Queen over there. I don't know why. Number two is don't make fun of ghosts because they believe in ghosts tremendously over there. Um, there's ghosts all over the place. Uh, number three is um, we often visited a bombed out church that had held black masses. Black masses is kind of like worshiping the devil. And um, that was uh, a little scary to go over there. I really remember those three things. Um, and I remember the my, uh, my fellow... Uh, Airmen that had uh, that had uh, committed suicide and and, um, and and did that. The other thing is I was coach of the soccer team on base, so uh, we played a, a soccer team all priest. They were all priest, and so whenever you fouled one of them or you bumped one of them, you what do you do? I'm sorry, Father. Do you want to hear my confession or you know like that stuff? So that was a very interesting because they were taking us seriously. We were just kind of like. And uh, they beat the pants off us, <laughs> you know, which, uh, so they loved that sport over there. Um, I can remember the place where I lived. Uh, the first nine months, uh, I rented a little place from an Italian guy. He spoke no English at all. He called every American Joe. Um, and uh, we had a, the heater we had was just a little bitty square thing and you had to put coins in it to keep it going so we had to wake up in the middle of the night and put coins in the heater to stay warm. Um, their kids would come up because we did have chocolate chip cookies and everything and they, when we were at home they'd go up into our apartment and take some cookies or something out of their, we didn't have a refrigerator we hung everything outside the door when it was winter time so all of our meat and everything hung out on hangers out on windows. The milk and all that stuff, and you could say I was well. That was tough, but actually, when I look back, that was kind of fun. Uh, and they take because they were going hungry, so they'd take food from us. Finally, we just started running stuff down to them, and so it was just the um, the learning what other countries do, and uh, it just makes you more acceptable to people over here and, and trying to help them. Um, any other more questions? Yeah, one more question. Did they really have tea time over there? Yes, they did. The first time I went to a pub over there, um, it was at 12.30. I had a beer, 
and at one o'clock they closed. I go, why are you guys closing? I go, they go, it's tea time. Well, I go, I don't have any tea. And they go, well, we'll make you some. So, uh, and then they close, they close their, uh, everything closes at nine o'clock there. So one time we went to the pub to play some darts. We went there at 8.30. They closed up at nine. So we had to adapt to that stuff. Um, but it was, it was a wonderful time. Uh, I, I, compared to where I could have been, uh, I'm grateful for, you know, where I was stationed and, uh, I, I'm just honored and thrilled every day that I was able to serve. Well, that's all the questions. Thank uh, you. Okay, you're welcome.